Hello there, good day, and welcome to another edition of Viewpoint. I'm your host, Eddie Lane. Of course, we continue to monitor what is happening in our country uh, since the passage of the no-confidence motion on December 21 of 2018, and of course, all the developments uh, following that vote. I have with me in studio the former Attorney General and uh, Minister of Legal Affairs, Anand uh, Welcome to the program. Thank you, Eddie, and um, good evening to your viewers. I we are monitoring uh, a number of, of, of issues, a number of developments um, over the past um, a few months, uh, two months or so, and of course, um, the recent developments in the courts and so forth. I want to start off first and foremost. We are hearing this talk about we are heading to a constitutional crisis. Are we indeed heading to a constitutional crisis, the first question. And the other question is, could you put that, all of that in context so Guyanese can understand clearly what are we heading to? Thank you again, Eddie. And um, I have spoken extensively and expansively on the issue of what will happen when the constitutionally prescribed time of three months expires and the government fails to go to an election. The consequences are not outlined in the Constitution because the Constitution does not contemplate a crisis situation. It does not provide for that kind of eventuality because I suspect that the framers of the Constitution never anticipated, never predicted, could have never projected that you would have a government that would act so flagrantly in violation of the prescribed and express provision of the Constitution. I have articulated a different fora that the concept of a no-confidence motion and its effect to defeat a government and to remove it from office is something that is not new. It, in fact, it has a recorded history of over 300 years. The first no confidence motion was passed in 1700 and something in England. And the consequences has never been or have never been uh, disobeyed or a government against whom a no confidence motion was passed never resisted the consequence which flow from it. In Guyana, we have a government that is openly violating the rule of law, violating the Constitution. Now, I am not surprised, Eddie, because if you recall, and viewers would recall, that since 2015, when they assumed office, I, perhaps more than any other person, have written over a thousand articles and have appeared and I don't know how many television programs in which I have highlighted instances of authoritarianism, of transgressions against the Constitution, constitutional violation in the most blatant way, both at individual levels in terms of particular ministerial conduct as well as, as an at an institutional level where the government as a collective in certain policy areas assumes postures and takes positions that are violative of the Constitution and the rule of law. I have had the occasion of challenging many of these actions in court and successfully getting the judiciary to declare these actions as unconstitutional. I say so simply to remind the audience that they should not be surprised having regard to the recent antecedents of this government and also its historical past because this is a government that rigged elections from 68, 1968 to 1992 in a different incarnation. It had a different name, it was a different dispensation, but the behavior was the same. It always demonstrated a proclivity 
not to obey the rule of law, not to play by the rules of the game, to violate the constitution, to cheat, to steal elections, and to act in a manner that is inimical to democratic norms and democratic traditions. That is the legacy of the People's National Congress. That is their history, and no one, no one can seriously dispute that. What we are seeing here is, with a little more sophistication, the same manifestation of abrogation of democratic norms, of transgressions against the Constitution, transgressions against the will of the people, and a, a, a violation of democratic norms and practices. I, I want to ask you, um, you know, because a lot of people are concerned about what will happen after the 21st of March, if you can shed some light. You, you did mention that the mm. Constitution uh, doesn't contemplate mm. that. but Now, <clears throat> the, the, the consequences which will flow are going to be myriad and uh, encompassing, and it would be difficult to iterate them on a program of this sort. What will happen is that the government becomes illegal, unconstitutional, extra-constitutional. So it comes out of the ambit of the rule of law and it, began to, it begins to rotate in an axis of illegality. All right? Now, there are so many things that will flow from that. Guyana as a nation state, Guyana as a nation state, and a, a, one, of a, one of the components of a nation state is a legitimate government. So we, may, we, we will begin to lose our status in the democratic order of the world as a nation state. That's the first thing. When that happens, then our relations, bilateral, and global, because the world is one global village now, and it's all interrelated in terms of trade and, and a whole host of, 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 of in diplomatic fronts, etc. So, for example, our status at the United Nations as a member will become under scrutiny. Our status at the OAS, where we are a member, will come under scrutiny. Our status at CARICOM will come under scrutiny. Our status at UNISAR will come under scrutiny. So that's one level. Diplomatically and politically, we will have some kind of repercussions of an adverse nature at that level in umbrella organizations. Then in terms of finances, Guyana is a third world country, developing third world country, and like every other developing third world country, it depends upon large inflows from international financial institutions to fund its economy, as well as capital projects within the economy. So we have, we receive on a yearly basis, huge fundings from institutions like the IADB, the World Bank, the IMF, the Caribbean Development Bank, um, China Exim Bank, Indian Exim Bank, depending on the nature of the investment and the type of funding that it requires. You know we live in a world, and if you was are aware, that we live in a world where there is great regulatory, regulatory framework that international institutions of a financial nature must comply with because we have anti-money laundering measures, we have countering the financing of terrorism measures, we have weapons of mass destruct destruction measures, and because it is suspected that legitimate monies are used and siphoned off through various institutions and avenues to fund illegitimate exercises, you have this regulatory body build up to scrutinize the structures of these organizations. These organizations have compliance requirements. When they begin, when they have to fund a, a, a government that is illegitimate and illegal, problem arises for them. Problem arises for them. So we, we will suffer those kinds of severing of relations. Then at a more local level, even our local banks, 
We have corresponding relations, as you know, with various banks of the world. America, Bank of America, for example, has an agent here, and um, different different banks, um, different banks in, in, in internationally have their their banking agents in Guyana. Those corresponding or correspondent relations are going to be damaged. So it would be difficult for businessmen to get money out of the country, to bring money into the country, and the, generally the transfer of money across borders are going to have problems, right? So that is uh, that level. Trade. Countries will not want to trade with, no one wants to trade with an illegal government because sanctions are going to be imposed. The democratic nations of the world have reached a stage where they will not countenance illegitimacy at the level of a government. You saw, we, we don't have to look far, look at the, the, the type of sanctions and treatment that are meted out to Venezuela. And people have different interpretations of who is the legitimate government in Venezuela. But the point I want to make, you only have to look at that country and you see a, a whole series of sanctions and countries jumping on board just to show solidarity with major forces of the world. So you have that kind of um, sanctions, that, that kind of effect. Then, of course, you have trade generally. Trade generally, goods coming in and out of the country. Uh, that, because we will have complications with the monetary system, then it will have an impact on trade and commerce. And I have only given you there the tip of the iceberg. Uh, of course, persons have cited, and I endorse the view, that Venezuela might see this as an opportunity to invade our country, with our government being illegitimate and they having um, a claim whether rightfully or wrongfully, to a part of territorial Guyana. They may see this as an occasion to exploit the weakness of a vacuum, a legal vacuum in the constitutional structure of the country. And, of course, we have a case that is pending at the World Court in relation to the same border matter. The implications must be negative if you have an illegitimate government. The the, the Guyana is represented in, in, in the World Court through its government. When the government becomes illegal, then questions will arise, because that is the World Court. I can't imagine that the World Court would want to countenance litigation where one of the litigants becomes illegal in their respective countries. So I, I just give you there um, a synopsis in the briefest possible way of the uh, implications, ramifications, and consequences which will arise. And it will have an impact, a negative impact, on the life of every single Guyanese. No one will become um, immune or protected from the avalanche of sanctions and ne negative implications which will flow. Uh, in terms of local um, impact, uh is there going to be impacts in, in terms of salaries, in terms of spending locally uh, from the government side and, 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 and how it will impact probably employees and so forth? Well, <clears throat> the government will tell you that they will pay um, their employees, state employees. But what will happen? The state only employs a very small fraction of Guyanese. The industry, the private sector, the private industries um, are what generate most of the employment in this country. What will happen to those people? And for how long will the state continue to pay employees? Because the state will also suffer from financial inflows, lack of financial inflows. Because if goods are not being imported, revenue stream are going to be, be, be declining. If we are not exporting because of the problems you, this thing will cause, for getting money into the country, getting goods, getting raw materials, etc., um, we are not going to export, so export will decline. So revenue right or wrong, the, the, uh, an already collapsing economy will become worse. It doesn't take any great economists to see the consequences. 
I, I want to take you over to, because you, you, you made mentions of um, the engagement at the levels of the court. Um, I want to hear from you what has been happening. We know that the, the Chief Justice would have ruled, including um, denying a stay. And of course, we had the, the recent case where the uh, Justice Rishi Prasad also um, denied a stay. Just give us a, a rundown as <coughs> to what is happening in the courts. No. I have again spoken at length on, on this matter. As you know, all the Chief Justice did was to interpret the relevant provisions of the Constitution. Fortunately, the particular provisions which were under scrutiny or under review were simple ones couched in very plain language and did not broker any space for ambiguities and ambivalence in the interpretation by the Chief Justice or by any person reading it. And that is why the Chief Justice decision is so simple but at the same time so difficult to upset. The major issues, whether 33 constitute a majority of 30, of 65. That's a, that's a mathematical, grammatical issue. That doesn't even require much law. Right? So that was not hard. Any child knows that. Who is acquainted with numbers will know that. Every single member of this government, including Ramjatan and and, and, and Basil Williams and Nagamutu, they all know that 33 is a majority of, 30, of 65. They sat in the parliament for 20-something years, some of them, voting that same way, 33 is, is a majority of 65. How suddenly, how suddenly it becomes not the majority. I mean, this is foolishness, foolishness. So the Chief Justice or any other justice, could not have ruled any other way on that issue. Let us deal with Charandas and his, um, his dual citizenship. First of all, they put him there. And there is a principle that the law will not allow anyone to invoke their own mistake, invoke their own wrong, and use that as a defense or a justification. As a matter of policy, the law does not allow you to do that. You can't enter into an illegal transaction and when to pay the man, you invoke the illegality of the transaction. All right? So that is what happened there. But quite apart from that, the Constitution says yes, and it was always, we all knew that. Every person conversant with the Constitution of Guyana knew that our Constitution outlaw um, dual citizens. But for political convenience, all political sides have kept quiet on that issue. There were rulings coming out of Jamaica and all parts of the Caribbean, and so our politicians were very much aware of it. But as a matter of policy and common convenience, they swept it under the carpet. And that's the truth. However, the Constitution also says that notwithstanding any deficiency in the qualifications of a member to sit in the National Assembly, that can't affect the, any proceeding in which that member participated. So the Constitution itself protects its own proceedings. So they could not have invalidated the no-confidence motion on that ground. And what is the other ground? I think that's the two grounds. So there, was, there is no way that any court can competently rule in any other way than the way that the Chief Justice ruled. So the foray to the Court of Appeal is, in my view, a futile exercise. There is only one way, in my view, the Court can rule. Because the constitutional provisions are there. You take it to anyone, go out overseas and ask people who, 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 who are conversant with reading of constitutions and so on. And they will tell you that the position is very clear. And that is why no stay can be granted, and the, 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 
the no confidence motion cannot be reversed. In fact, where we are heading now is by the time the cases are going to be determined even at the Court of Appeal stage, the 90 days would have expired. When the 90 days expire, nothing can be done to reverse that. Nothing can be done to reverse that. The, the Constitution right now, it, the time is ticking all the time. And after 90 days is completed, the government becomes illegal by operation of law, by operation of the constitutional provisions taking effect. I see the Ramjatan arguing on a television um, program or on the internet somewhere I saw, arguing about the doctrine of necessity. The doctrine of necessity is a doctrine that is invoked when something that is uncontemplated, unforeseen, takes place. And to save the existing order, the doctrine of necessity comes in. You can't invoke the doctrine of necessity to correct a wrong that you deliberately have committed. What we have here is the government failing to take the steps which the Constitution mandates it to take. And when it catapults itself into a state of illegality because of its own action or omission, it cannot, the law will not allow, the law does not allow the doctrine of necessity to be used in that situation. Or else everybody will invoke the doctrine of necessity after they have committed a wrong. Does that make sense? Yes. So, Eddie, the court proceedings at current, we have some guidelines that we have to comply with in terms of providing submissions in from all sides. When those submissions are in, the court, I suppose, will rule. We don't, as a matter of course, we, we when I say we, I mean lawyers appearing for uh, myself, uh, Sanjeev Datidin, uh, Kamal Ramkaran, and the whole group of us who are appearing. Um, we have decided that we want the cases to be concluded. We are convinced that there is no other way that the court can rule, and um, we are going to do everything in our endeavors in the court to not to protract and delay and to expedite the I wanna, hearings. I want to ask you about two other things coming out of the court. The Attorney General um, would have said that the Constitution is ultra-virus. And also, um, I think he said that yesterday, he also said, or a few days ago rather, when uh, on Thursday when that um, stay was refused. And yesterday, he said that the government can remain in office after the 90 days or until a new government is, uh, so a new president is sworn in. Could you, could you respond to that? There is no doubt that our Attorney General have carved a place out in modern history for himself with the most unique statements that emanate from this gentleman. I mean, every time you think that, you know, we can't have a more unique statement, and I use that word very advisedly, from this gentleman, he goes and he surpasses it with another one. Now, I saw him telling the press that the Constitution is unlawful. The Constitution is wrong. Um, uh, that statement demonstrates, and I say this with the greatest of respect, a lack of basic understanding of what a supreme law is. The Constitution is our supreme law. If the Constitution says that this wristwatch is a motor car, then the wristwatch becomes a motor car. The Constitution can't be wrong. That is the supreme law. If it says that this wristwatch is a motor car, it means that the Constitution has changed the character of this wristwatch and make it into a motor car. And that becomes the law of Guyana, the most supreme law. So if the Constitution... So, and that is what the supreme law means. So how can the Constitution be wrong? It cannot be wrong. Whatever the Constitution says is the law. Is the law. You can change it, but until you change it, it is the law. 
Then he says, uh, he makes another statement, that the Constitution, that Article 106 is ultra vires the Constitution. Ultra vires means that something is outside. It is not intra vires. It's ultra vires. 106 is part of the Constitution. How can it be ultra vires the Constitution? So it, it's, it's, it's extraordinarily difficult to try to explain these, these statements when they come from the Attorney General. Only he can understand what he's saying because nobody else can interpret it. Then um, he says that the government can stay in office forever until another government is elected. I mean, you only have to read the Constitution. If that is the position, then we don't have to call elections ever. We don't have to. Isn't that what he's saying? In essence. Yeah, that if no government is elected, well, this one stay forever. <laughs> he would like, that is their thinking, you see. You see, the con to an authoritarian, to a dictator, the Constitution and documents like the Constitution, democracy, democratic concepts are obstacles. You've got to understand philosophically and ideologically how these people brain process information. They see themselves as being all-powerful, can do anything that they wish. When they hear that the Constitution says that you can't do this, it, it, affects, their men, men, it affects them mentally because they can't process. How is it that I am in government and I have to bother with that Constitution? That thing is a burden. What they don't understand is that it is the Constitution that put them into government. But these are people who have demonstrated um, very, very clearly and emphatically that they are not going to abide by any rules. That is why I keep saying to people like Ralph Ramkaran, and who are arguing for constitutional reform, that that will not solve the problem. You have to get people, politicians, to obey the Constitution, whatever it is. We want to reform. You... you you, you are reforming to suit the recalcitrance, to suit the, 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 the disobedience of, of, of the politician. When you play a cricket match, for example, and one side does not obey the rules, do you go and redraft the rules? You don't want to, you can't blame the rules and blame the cricket match. You have so that is the problem we have. And as I said to you, I don't know when we will get rid of this problem. As a country, we are over 60 years old. And from the birth of our nation state in 1966, we have had this problem in the PNC. So I don't know for how long the Guyanese public and Guyana as a country will have to fetch on their back the authoritarian PNC government or PNC political party. And that seems to be like a, like a rock on people's shoulders. Burnham, um, I remember Prime Minister Errol Barrow once said that Burnham is a cross that all Caribbean people have to fetch. The PNC is the same thing here in Guyana. I want to take you over to the issue of GCOM because we have seen a lot of things happening there, um, which the opposition has been um, characterizing as delay tactic in, 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 um, with support from the government. Let's talk a little bit about GCOM the, the, and, and the laws that govern GCOM and, and the conduct of elections. From the time Mr. James Patterson, retired judge, was appointed in the manner in which he was appointed by President Granger, I have been saying that GCOM has lost its efficacy, its constitutional impartiality as a body, and, ha and lost its autonomy and independence. I said that from the beginning, because this man was plucked out of nowhere, out of anonymity by the president, after rejecting 18 outstanding Guyanese submitted to him by the leader of the opposition in accordance with the constitution, President Granger rejected all of them, never gave any sensible reasons why, 
and shows this 80 something year old man after just sending home Justice Prempasad and Justice Kennard, Prempasad from the Judicial Service Commission, Kennard from the Police Service Commission, on the ground of their age, and they were both younger than Patterson. And Mr. Patterson said on his curriculum vitae that he was the Chief Justice of Grenada and I have asked him to produce that document evidencing that or the instrument of his appointment and he has never done that. So from the time Patterson was appointed, I personally speaking and I have said it publicly, GCOM lost its impartiality. So GCOM is not a partial body anymore. It's not an impartial body anymore. And everything that has happened since verify and corroborates my view. Right? So every time there is a casting vote, Mr. Justice Patterson casts it in favor of the government. That cannot be coincidence. So, the, the role of a GCOM the constitutional autonomous body charged exclusively with the functional responsibility of holding elections. The duty of that organization is to be ready for elections at any given time. And at any given time, the constitution gives it three months notice. Whether the president, if it wants to fix a date for elections, the president has to give the, the, the nation, by way of a proclamation, three months notice. Right? If it's a no confidence motion vote, it's a three months notice again. So the constitution has fixed uniformly a period of three months for GCOM to get ready for elections. And that was three months period was chosen by the framers of the constitution because they felt that GCOM can ready itself for three months, within three months. And GCOM can, especially at this point in time when it just completed a local government elections, which is far more complex and complicated than national elections. They have 10,500 trained staff available to them. They have the machinery well oiled, just performed the elections. So there is nobody who can convince me that GCOM cannot be ready. And GCOM is violating its fundamental constitutional function by not readying itself for election. So there is a game being played, in my view. There is a game being played. Now you, you would recall that the president was saying at one time that he was waiting on GCOM. Remember that? Yes. And GCOM at one time was ready. Lowenfield came out during the month of December, shortly after the no confidence motion, and said that he can be ready for elections. Within it, he was obviously speaking within the time frame. He could be ready in a matter of weeks, I think he said, at that time. Obviously, the, the signal was sent from the government to him, to the GCA machinery, to say, you can't be ready because we, are not, we don't want elections. And the game began to play. G, the president saying, well, I have to wait on GCOM. Right. First of all, they were saying, Everything was all right when the no-confidence motion was first passed. Remember the night and the next day, the president said, yes, we're going to elections. Then Nigel Hughes came up with this brilliant idea about this 34, 33 majority craziness. And then everybody started to get bright and different ideas. And we're not resigning anymore. And, and the no-confidence motion is invalid. And all, everything started to, under the sun, start to be thrown. And then this game started be, between the government and the president. You see now, because of international pressure, the president is saying, look, I am ready. That is only to placate the international community and to put on the record that the government is ready. But the government wrote G come and said, well, you know, you are responsible, so you tell me when you are ready. And that is the game that they are playing. Because that message was already communicated to G come to say, you play along with me. Say that you are not ready. And you see, they said to the leader of the opposition now, well, we need the money from parliament to go back to prepare for elections. You see the letter that the president sent to the leader of the opposition? Yes. So the president has explicated himself. He said, look, my government is ready, but you, GCOM, you have to be ready. And you, Jack Dale, you have to 
get the parliament going. When you all fix it up, I am ready to come. That is what the president in essence is saying. So he has shifted the burden over to the leader of the opposition now and shifted it over to, 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 to GCOM. That is his public posture. So any diplomat now ask him, he will say, but you see my position, my government is ready. But GCOM is not ready. They want money now for to do um, um, elections. They have money only to do house-to-house -house registration. They want money to do elections. My finance people said that the law doesn't permit them to fire and change the use. So they have to stick to house-to-house -to -house, um, registration with the money that they have. If they want new money now, well, they have to get it from parliament. And that involves the leader of the opposition. You all want to speak to him. He now got to come to parliament. You understand? So it's a carefully strategized um, plan that is being orchestrated here. But I don't know who it, who it is fooling. It's not fooling me. But that is where, that is the, where the, the state of play is currently. And they're going to kick this ball around about date for elections until, you know, they, they do their campaigning. Um, as you see, they are fanning out all over the country. And um, what they did not do in four and a half years, they want to do it now. Right? So promises that were 100-day plan promises from their manifesto are now being implemented. The people of Linden and so on are so loved now, so they get back, they get their television station, which they were promised for I don't know how many years ago. Um, you see the, the disgraceful showing in the Rupununi, with, where our Amerindian brothers are now being reduced to the, e the Columbus era, where they are being given, you know, when the Spaniards came here, they give them beads and they give them mirrors and so on. And that's how they got them to give over land and give over gold and so on. Well, the same thing happening now. This time it is votes. And they're getting a rubber slippers and a half a sack bag. That's what is going on in, 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 with the government right across the country. So they are sharing this thing. Remember, they have $300 billion in the budget. They are not doing any capital work. Right? So they're not doing much. So the money is, is being left back. So they're sharing it out. That's for election, election purposes. But isn't, isn't that an abuse of state resources? You're still concerned that this <laughs> government worries about abuse of state resources? <laughs> These people are holding on to power illegally. You don't know who you're dealing with. Eh? <laughs> so uh, state resources, they don't bother these people. The attorney general said the constitution is wrong. You are worried about abuse of, of, of state resources. You are dealing with a mentality here, you know. Nothing, these people will, you have to get, you have to physically lift them out of office. That is what has to happen in Guyana. That is when you have demagogues and dictators in political office. That's the reality of Guyana. And that's what we had to do in 1992. And we have to do it again. And it's up to the Guyanese people whether they want, if they're not seeing you see race and ethnicity destroying this country. The only thing that keeps the PNC in office is race. Is race. No rational mind can look at their performance, look at their behavior, and ever consider them to be a viable force. And that is the reality. People don't want to say it. I might get a lot of calls for saying it, say, say that on this program. But for how long are you not going to say the truth? We can't solve the problems of this country until we confront the problems. And we have to confront them first by discourse and by talking about it. How long are we going to hide this problem? The PNC is a problem in Guyana. It is a problem in modern politics. And we have to get rid of it. You've got to change the mentality of the people. I don't know how to do it. I'm not a psychologist. But at least I recognize the problem. And we have to speak about the problem. Your closing comments as, as we wrap things up here. Eddie, we are in a very somber and sober state. Um, it, it is worrying the future. Anybody who wants to live in Guyana must be worried about the future direction of our country. We don't know. Guyana is a very volatile place. We are susceptible for, to, to racial-inspired violence, ethnic-inspired violence. We are a society that... Mm, 
that is really um, divided along political and ethnic um, lines, and that blurs people's objectivity, you know. It's difficult sometimes to see right from wrong in Guyana because we look at things through an ethnic and racist prism, and that's unfortunate. Um, and that is exacerbated by, by what is going on um, in, in the country. Uh, it's unfortunate that we find ourselves at this stage after 60 years of independence because this has been a problem that we have had to fetch our entire life as a nation state. We are poised for great um, things economically with, um, I, I, was, I am of a firm view that once we solve the energy problem in Guyana, the energy, cost of, 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 of energy, Guyana, there's hardly another economy that can hold or, 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 or be equal to Guyana when we start to perform, once we solve that problem. And with the advent of our oil resources, we, we are very close to solving that problem and then get additional um, money from oil. So we are at a very, very um, great place to take off, but we are saddled in this unfortunate dilemma from which we can't extricate ourselves. So. Uh, um, you know, we are at a place where we have to do some introspection, and, 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 and I don't know how, how we move forward from here, but we got to keep talking about it. Mahabir Anil Nandalala, I want to thank you very much for joining us. Uh, the, uh, member of Parliament of the Most Progressive Party, and of course, um, a former Tory General, uh, the, the, one of the lawyers representing the leader of the opposition in the ongoing cases, um, the challenges by the government to the no confidence motion. I, I want to thank you very much for being here and being very insightful today. Thank you very much for inviting me to be here. Thank you. And those of you at home, we want to thank you very much for being part of this program. We can be back here to talk about what is happening in our country as we keep you informed of these developments. Bye for now.